Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Tinnitus TV. Today I am talking with the one and only Marshall Crenshaw. I don't know how much you know about him, but you should know this. Marshall Crenshaw is no one-trick pony. Over the last 40 years, he's had one of the most unusual and unpredictable careers in music. As an artist, he's released 10 albums with hits like Someday, Someway, Cynical Girl, and Whenever You're On My Mind. As a songwriter, he's penned singles for artists like Gin Blossoms and Kirsty McCall. As an actor, he's portrayed Buddy Holly in La Bamba and John Lennon in Beatlemania. He also appeared in the movie Peggy Sue Got Married and the TV show Pete and Pete. He's been nominated for Grammy and Golden Globe Awards. He's hosted a radio show. He's written a book about rock music in the movies. And he's putting the finishing touches on his own documentary about groundbreaking music producer Tom Wilson. On top of all of that, lately he's been reissuing some of his classic albums. The latest being his 1999 release, number 447. It's a relaxed, freewheeling album that includes everything from pop singles to jazzy guitar instrumentals. And the updated version also includes his first new songs in several years. A few weeks before the return of number 447, Crenshaw got on the Zoom to talk about the music of his youth, all of his current projects, what's coming up for him, and a lot more. On a technical note, the audio on his end is a little shaky at times, but not so bad that it was worth stopping our chat. Enjoy. Well, listen, first of all, thanks for doing this today, Marshall Crenshaw. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Daryl. Thanks for your interest. Oh, of course, of course. So after so many years of moving from one project to another project to another project, what's it like now to stop for a minute and look in the rear view mirror like you've been doing with, with these reissues? Uh, I think it's a pretty good time in life for doing it. I'm getting to be an old person. <laughs> Already an old person. I'm getting to be a even older. Per anyway, what I'm trying to say is, you know, it's not a bad time for like taking stock and uh, all that kind of thing. And these, these reissue records that we're talking about here, I, I got uh, the copyrights back to them a little while right. ago. So I'm just trying to do the responsible thing and make sure that they're out there and uh, in the best possible uh, manner. And that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm curating my catalog is what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm guessing you probably haven't listened to these albums a lot since you put them out. Um, you know, what's it like when you put them on again for the first time? I mean, are you taken back to when you were recording them? Do they hold up for you? Yeah, um, the one specifically that we're kind of like looking at here is uh, an album called uh, an album of mine called Number Four Hundred and Forty Seven, and that's just a random number, like a joke album title. Oh, okay. Because I couldn't think of a better one, uh, and uh, it's the second. It was the second album that I did for a label called Razor and Tie Records. I got all my Razor and Tie right. masters back, right? So. Uh, these particular ones, there's this one that's coming out officially uh, in February. And then uh, the first album that I did for the label was re-released at uh, right at the very start of lockdown, <laughs> right in time for all the, yeah, right in time for all the record stores to go dark. But anyway. Yeah, that, was, uh, that was Miracles of Science, just for the miracle record. Miracle of right? Science, yes. And uh, uh, your question was, did they hold up? Yeah, those, yeah. these two albums in particular, for me, they do hold up really nicely. What What is it about them that that makes them hold up in particular for you? Well, for me, it has to do with, you know, what kind of memories come back, you know, when I listen to them. And mm -hmm. with these particular ones, it was just a, like a nice window of time in my life mm -hmm. where I could think clearly and really had a, you know, felt really inspired and motivated and focused and, uh, with Miracle of Science, I was really autonomous for the first time in ages because I had just gotten out of the major label system, so to speak, and I was happy about that. And then with 
number 447, I was just even more in that same mode where I'm just like, I'm out here on my own and nobody's looking over my shoulder. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. so that, they're not, you know, they just have a nice association for me in that way. I just think of it as a good time for me. All right. What was it that you were unhappy? Uh, and I'm not trying to get you to say anything bad about Razor and Tie at all, but uh, is it that you were sort of unhappy just being in that system? Uh, or was it just that you, you know, that was fine, but this was just so much freer? No, Razor and Tie was, uh, that was, that was when, you know, I kind of crossed this threshold into a space where I was autonomous. I, I, I said before I, I got out of the major label right. world just before I got with Razor and Ty. Yeah. And uh, so, um, yeah, I was, again, I was glad, uh, you know, the, the major label world was always kind of absurd to me from the start. And uh, it was like, you know, just too much, too much, uh, too many layers of, of, you know, what, and, uh, <laughs> well, and they always so seem to want to was, Razor and Tie was great because Razor and Tie was uh, entirely hands off. That's that was a, such a a jarring shift for me, but it was a, it was a welcome shift. You know? Yeah, well, I mean, and you can hear it on, on the albums. I mean, especially on this one, you know, you've got uh, well, you've got geez, three instrumentals on there. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, and and obviously there's some jazz. There's you know, you're really it seems following wherever the, you know, the inspiration leads you on, on this record. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. And well, the instrumentals, I was working on this TV soundtrack at the time. And so I thought, Oh, this is a nice one. I'll put it on the album. And, uh, oh, okay. That, that was yeah. it, you know. Always repurposing, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and there's another song, there's another song on the album called right there in front of me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this for the re-release, I put the word demo in parentheses after the song title because it's a song that I didn't write for myself to sing and I wouldn't have written it for myself to sing. I wrote it at the request of an AR person hmm. who was developing a pop act. Like you remember Hansen from yes. back in back in the day? Well, you know, this was this was sort of like, supposed to be a uh a, you know another recycling of that kind of thing you know another version of, of a Hanson type group and the guy reached out to me to write a song for this act because I just co-written one of the Gin Blossoms hit singles right so anyway I heard from this A&R person and this I like this guy still you know uh, he asked me to write this pop song for the group and uh I wound up doing it by myself. I first was asked to collaborate with one of the guys in the group, but you know, we just kind of sat there in his hotel room and <laughs> like, you know, he was just sitting there, you know? And so after a while, I just said, well, let me see if I can come up with something on my own. So I split and I sent the song that I wrote by myself to the A&R person. And it just kind of got the thumbs down, but I think that might've been something to do with business considerations mm -hmm. because I wrote it all by myself. So yeah, well, nobody, he couldn't get any copyright on it then, right? Right. Nobody was going to get any piece of the action. So uh, anyway, I, th I liked it. And I thought, well, I don't want this to just go into the black hole. So I put it on my album. But again, it's it's more like a it's like a pop group kind of song. That, right. You know, you know. And I mean, the other thing that struck me sort of with, with how much guitar there is on the album is I don't think you ever really got credit i mean you kind of got boxed into this singer songwriter you know slot yeah but as this album and some of the other ones obviously make make clear you, you know you were a lot more i mean you're 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 a great guitar player uh, um you're playing pretty much what 90 percent of of the the music on these albums it's 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 all you you're an excellent drummer i was surprised reading the credits going hey wait a minute that's you so i mean it feels like part of what you were doing here was kind of going, hey, you know, I'm not just this guy who who's a singer songwriter. Oh, well, thank you, number one. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's I'm a guitar player in the first place. Mm -hmm. And like I got going on this whole 
rock a tour thing from day one just to sort of give myself a platform as a guitar player that's really what it was i'm like well if i'm going to show myself in the best light i have to sort of invent everything or make you know create everything write everything so i mean I've always, but when i did my first album i just got enough of beatlemania right for a couple of years and i, I hadn't, hadn't really focused that much on my own guitar playing leading up to that album you know but over the years you know when i was getting into making my own records then i did focus kind of getting myself back oriented towards playing but the like the first album of mine is probably the one that most people have heard so sure. the guitar the guitar playing and the guitar sound may, is maybe not so individualistic on that one as it is on the later ones Mm -hmm. So people say, oh, I didn't know you could play guitar like that. But that, you know, I get I get why that is an impression that people or a thing that people say. I get I get that, you know. Right. So who do you admire as a guitar player? Who were you sort of, you know, listening to and taking your cues from? Well, I've been interested in it like always since I was a kid and uh, a little kid even. And uh, the first record I heard, I had a guitar since I was eight you know my, my dad had one himself and it was just this kind of little parlor size thing that he picked up somewhere and uh you know i used to drag it around the house and beat on it and stuff so he decided to get one of my own for me when i was about eight we went to sears and bought a guitar similar to the one that he had and uh so it's kind of sat around the house for a while but the first record i heard that made me say, now, nah, I'm play right now. It was one called, by a group called the Rebels, or the Buffalo Rebels, from Western New York. If you heard a little snatch of this one, you would go, oh yeah, that one. But it's got this, you know, crude, beautiful guitar solo on it, and I wanted to play. And, uh, and more recently, I really like Bill Frisell a lot. He's kind of like my, sure, you know, and I guess my favorite right now, mm -hmm. but along the way, there's everybody, I guess, you know. Right. I so said my dad took us to see Jimi Hendrix when my brother and I were 14 and 12. And no kidding. Yeah. I saw, oh, him, right. I saw him live when I was in my <laughs> early teens. Wow. That must have been exciting. It was. It was incredible. It was um, in Detroit at this venue called sonic auditorium and uh not a huge place you know it wasn't an, an arena it was a maybe like a 2000 seater mm. or something like that but uh i remember it really well i remember that the production of the concert was just as crude and as cheap as you could get because it was very <laughs> early in the evolution of rock shows you know it was right, like the right. whole rock concert thing was just going from where it was girls screaming to where people were now listening. So, but the promoters of this show got like the cheapest PA system they could, that they sure. thought they could get away with. But anyway, it was still great. One of the opening acts was the MC5. <laughs> Another one of the opening acts was a group called the Soft Machine. Well, come on. <laughs> it's just nuts. It was, it was really great. all this crazy regalia and just it was 1968 right yeah uh, and my brother and i were kind of looking around taking mental notes but anyway i've just you know i've been a fan of the music sure I, sure always from the start you know so so going going back to these albums um when you went in to start you know putting together these reissues um is it was there a lot of technical challenges for you did you have to like you know revamp stuff or tweak mixes or or was it pretty much just oh these are in great shape and i can just you know digitize them and put them out with um with four, number 447 the current one mm -hmm. i did completely leave everything alone on that record the only thing we did was uh it was mastered again 
hmm. from the original tapes and uh and they're tapes too they're like actual analog master tapes but, uh anyway it had to be remastered because the records had never been on vinyl before this is right, that's, a, right. a, that's a, yeah that's another little hook of this whole thing is that they're on right. vinyl now so with number 447 it just went i took it to mr calby greg calby and he, right. he did it again he did it originally we had to do it again because he didn't still have the the masters that he made back in 1999 if he'd still had the same ones i would have maybe gone with those but anyway we did that with miracle of science i i, I kind of cheated with that because there were a couple tracks that that bugged me you yeah. know like i heard a couple guitar solos and i said this is maximalism you know i don't think like that anymore i i, I did cheat on a couple tunes on miracle of science but i figured uh -huh. i can if i want to right <laughs> of course yeah you can, you, can, you can george lucas your world as much as you want man <laughs> yeah but with 447 it was all it's all the same well that's great um, yeah 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 i mean it's nice that you didn't have you know you didn't hit that point that you know you didn't have any cringy moments or or high school yearbook type uh you know <laughs> incident there so you also you also have a couple of new songs um on on these um which is kind of a, a an unusual move i mean most of the time things like this you would expect to get you know a couple outtakes maybe some b-sides an old live thing whatever so yeah. what made you go oh you know what I've, i'm gonna put some new songs on here well uh that's kind of me tricking myself really into having to do because <laughs> i'm like really lazy and uh, but so i built that into the distribution megaforce they're the distributor of the stuff now and when we made the deal i offered you know i said well how about you know if i agree to do two completely brand new recordings with each reissue mm. as bonus tracks and that way i made a commitment to record you know i'm one of those people that needs a deadline right so oh okay i get you it's a it's a fault of mine but uh Anyhow, that's really it. And uh, so the, the bonus tracks that I did for Miracle of Science, I didn't write either one of the songs. One of the, of the, of the uh, one bonus track for Miracle of Science was a, a song that you might know because, well, forgive me, but you might know this one because it's Canadian in origin. It uh -huh. was uh, What the Hell I've Got by Michelle Pagliaro. Sure. A great favorite, a great favorite of mine from CKLW. So I did a version of that, and then the other side was a tune called "Misty Dreamer" by the Scottish rock artiste that I like, named Daniel Daniel Wiley. Mm -hmm. But to get to the pertinent thing, um, the bonus tracks for Free one are are brand new. They're the first yeah. brand new things that I've done since 2016, and. Uh, you know i love doing it i just I, I just i gotta i gotta get back into songwriting and recording just for because it does actually bring yes. me joy brings me joy <laughs> to do it you know not just you sir there are other people who would who would oh yeah other people. Work. <laughs> yeah oh well that's really good so uh anyway well, i did these two you know uh -huh. during so, lockdown I mean, I, right at the height of lockdown yeah so were you able to to just as a songwriter having not written something for for years can you just flip the switch and write a song or was this something where you had to sort of write 10 shitty songs to get this good song no fortunately i did get an idea you know when i started realizing for me to do it you know and uh yeah i i was just sitting on an airplane and i got this idea in my head you know and you know how i did, what triggered the idea was i was thinking this was in 2019, late end of 2019. I, I was on a plane and uh, thinking about the fact that I had dates on the calendar then mm. to go out on this fan. Have you ever heard of the bottle rockets? Of course, love the bottle rockets. Great. Okay. Well, for the last 11 years or so, I've, I've toured with them mm. where, you know, we kind of split the show. They, they play the first set and then. I come out and we do my stuff, you know, with them. And I've, you know, I've done that for 
all these years, and I had shows on the calendar that were going to happen. So I started thinking how nice it would be to have a brand new song to play with that. Mm. That's, that's, that's a, I got into this kind of groove in my mind of a song that would be cool to play with them. And I put this little drum break in it, like a train thing. I thought, boy, Mark Ortman could really kill this, you know, and I just mm. wanted to make it an exciting song to play on stage. And, uh, but then shortly thereafter, of course, you know what happened. It was just like all the dates got blown off the calendar and yeah. everything else that happened, you know, the whole nightmare. So, uh, but that's how I got started with, will. it's called Will of the Wind. Yes. That's the name of it. And it fits right in with the album too. Like it doesn't sound like, you know, you've got this album from this period and then all of a sudden this song is is way out of whack. It's 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 fairly seamless. I mean, is that just because you're so consistent or were you actually kind of trying to make it segue in? No, I didn't know that. I didn't, I mean, no, I did. I knew, that, I knew about the bonus track thing. Hmm. No, it just, it was just that moment when I thought of this Mm -hmm. piece of music there wasn't there oh, okay. was nothing, well, you know, something. I mean you haven't you haven't lost a step then so has this have you written any more songs since then no but I will I promise come on man <laughs> <laughs> you've got uh, a you. you've got a talent here you should be uh sharing it with the rest of us you know there's enough thank shitty you. music out there we could use more good music <laughs> thank you that's what, that's what my wife says she says you you know you anyway well I mean it does sound I'll like do it I will do it yeah, well, it does sound like you're kind of inspired again, if 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 not, you know, instantly with with songs popping into your head, but at least the idea of writing songs. Yeah, no, I, I really intend to to pick back up on it. I really Great. will. I mean, I really enjoyed doing Will of the Wind. That was one I, I had to do it myself. I did the whole thing. And then uh I loved recording the B-side too, which is a song not I didn't write the B-side. It's uh, Greg song Turner, called. right? Yeah. yeah, Greg Turner. But I loved, you know, my recording of it is different from his. Just I started from scratch. And uh, so that was a gas. And then just a short little while ago, I did a a cover a version of a Todd Rundgren song for a a tribute album. No, which one? Coming out. Well, there's some, they're doing a tribute album to the Something Anything album, cool. right? different artists are doing tracks from yeah. something anything which so one did I you did, do i did one called couldn't i just tell you and okay. i picked picked that one because i could just remember it off the top of my head from when i sang it in a bar band <laughs> back in the <laughs> 70s so uh, anyway i've been recording a little bit over the past Great. year or so and it's just like I, I really do love to do this so you know did you talking about outtakes from this album i mean like were there a bunch because uh, you kind of have the sense listening to the album that you know you you obviously weren't uh married to some sort of okay i have to write 10 singles and blah 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 you were just able to go in the studio and be creative and have an idea and chase it down so i'm kind of guessing that maybe you had a lot more ideas uh, and songs and ended up on the album there might be some things, you know, I'd have to kind of go back and listen to like tapes that I have because right now I don't remember what they were because now right. it's been a while. Yeah. But, you know, maybe, yeah, there might have been some things that I started and didn't finish. But you're not like uh, somebody who's writing 50 or 60 songs for an album and the cataloging all this stuff and has this vast organized archive. It's just all kind of in a closet somewhere. I, anymore, I don't, you know, I, I, yeah. I never was uh you know like i never kept a notebook or a journal mm. as far as like the lyric writing went that would always be like in the spur of the moment wow or i, I mean in the time frame of my writing whatever i was right. writing, whatever song right. but uh i did used to stockpile riffs and different ideas and stuff I, I just recently my wife and i decided to clean out our attic and it was it felt great to do it you know but i found all these cassettes and uh some of them i looked at the outside and i kind of recognized what they were but but yeah they're like i haven't listened to them yet but i have them set aside and it's just me trying out different riffs and like stomping my feet in a hotel room and humming to myself or whatever there you go there's your next album right there just you know pull some oldies out that's not a bad idea 
Uh, that's actually a cool idea. So thank it, you. For it that. worked for. I mean, Van Halen made an album with songs that were like four, you know, riffs that were like forty years old. So you know, you, you can yeah. certainly, you can certainly do it. So so talking about you mentioned you know, being in Beatlemania, and obviously you you played Buddy Holly and La Bamba. You've done things on 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 Pete and Pete. The band was in Peggy Sue got married. Um, was there a part of you that that wanted to be an actor? No, honestly, um, no? never. Um, I got it was kind of it was completely like le a left field thing that I. Did. I mean, it was it was a turning point and mm. it was a giant good luck. But uh, when I I saw an article in Time Magazine about Beatlemania, it was just a hit on Broadway, and I was still living in Michigan. I hadn't made any kind of career move yet other than just playing in bar bands and stuff. But right. I saw this article in Beatlemania about Beatlemania and I looked at the pictures and I was just like completely disgusted by the thought of it, you know. But uh, <laughs> then a little bit of time passed and I had the chance to be in it. So I just jumped on it, you know, as a pragmatic mm -hmm. thing. I, at some point I decided that I should be pragmatic. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That's good. So I'm not I, I, it didn't last very long. But anyway, I, I got <laughs> in Beatlemania just out of left field and uh, the acting part was the part that I struggled with because they wanted us to, there was this one little moment in the show where we were supposed to just do this like little banter, you know, like cute Beatle type banter and with the accents and stuff. And I would always just kind of stand there and let the other guys do it. <laughs> Cause I, I don't know why, but I've always hated the sound of, American people trying to speak right. with British accents and doing it badly. Going all the way back to when the Beatles came out, you know, I was a 10 year old kid and I loved that part of it immediately. Mm -hmm. but, but people around me, I would hear kids try to cop their accents and stuff and I'd go, cut it out. You know, I, I don't know why it would annoy me, but it would. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's always some little pet peeve thing that I've had, you know. Fair enough. Fair enough. But you're obviously a big movie buff. I mean, you wrote the book, oh, yeah. Hollywood Rock Guide. So yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that I can't imagine that that seems like what was it 850 movies uh, you write about in there? That's, that's insane. <laughs> that's true. I mean, I personally reviewed um, about 40 of them. But mm -hmm. what I was really hands on with the book. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a uh, for sure. I'm a film fan. And uh, are there some favorite uh, music movies uh, that you keep going back to? When we did the book, I got that question. And uh, mm -hmm. the, I remember the, some of the ones I named as favorites then. Uh, I really liked uh, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. I don't oh, know if yeah, you know okay. that one. Yeah. Russ Meyer. Russ and Meyer and Roger really, Ebert, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, that's a great one, you know. I mean, it's it's funny and crazy and the music's really good. and It's, it's just my happening funny. and it freaks me out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. And uh, there was one that I really liked back then called Wild Guitar. Okay. Starring a guy named Arch Hall Jr. Sure, I remember that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, his film career was basically initiated and bankrolled by his dad. Yeah, who I was going to say. decided yeah. that his son should be a, a rock star and a movie star. Is that the Western one? No. Uh, okay. Because there's a Western one too, right? I think with him. Yeah, I, I forget now, but yeah, yeah, I believe so. Okay. Uh, anyway, sorry. Go on. Wild yeah, Guitar is really good. It's it's like a really decent rock and roll movie, a really decent kind of low budget film with good production values. Uh, the cinematographer was uh, Vilmos Sigmund, who later went oh, okay. on to do like Close Encounters of the Third Kind yeah, yeah, and all this yeah. stuff. You know, so it's like really some brilliant people that made this funny little cheap movie <laughs> have, uh, have you seen I like the oddball ones huh have you seen get back i haven't seen get back no oh okay i think you'd uh, obviously I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you would think of it because you know as i'm sure you've read it's eight hours and you're yeah. you know right there in the studio with them watching you know paul mccartney come up with songs off the top of his head that are now you know classics and stuff so it's a it's a pretty fascinating yeah thing have you, yeah, seen, have you know i haven't had a chance yet uh 
my wife and I don't have that TV channel and we don't really want to get it. So, you know, the Disney channel, when, when our kids were 12 or whatever, we had the Disney channel, but anyway, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll get, I'll get around to get back, but I'll tell you, yeah, you reminded me that there is one that I saw just recently yeah. that if there was an eight hour version of this one, I would be seeing it now. And that's summer of soul. Oh, of course. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that or not, but I would love for there to be an eight hour version of that one. Like the sooner, the better. (laughs) I saw that one. I saw it three times, twice at the theater, once at home. There's a, I just talked to a director the other day who he's got a a documentary coming out called Ronnie's and it's about uh, Ronnie Scott's jazz club over in London. And it's Uh tons and tons of old archival BBC footage of, of like, Miles and uh, she's Ella Fitzgerald, Van Morrison, and Chet Baker duetting, um, wow. just all kinds of great stuff. So you know that that one for me has has really stood out lately. Highly recommended if you get a chance to see it down the road. Oh, it already, it's already it already exists. It's it's yeah, it's, it's coming out in North America uh, February mid February. So it'll probably be popping up on on some other TV channel. You don't get. <laughs> well you know that that's i would i would grab that one if i had a chance to see it yeah yeah it's it's a keeper do you do you have uh movie uh, or music memorabilia are you a collector of stuff it doesn't sound like it since you don't even really take care of your own stuff i no, i'm not so much a collector you know i might have this and that or the mm-hmm. other thing but no not not really uh i mean i have records and mm-hmm. all that but and you know I have books and records but I mean, like, no, I don't have rock and roll posters in my house, if that's what you mean. I should get some, maybe, but uh-huh, uh-huh. is this so the right time for me to mention that I'm, is this the right time for me to mention that I'm making a documentary myself? That was exactly where I was going. Tell oh, me you know it. about it. All right. The Tom Wilson movie you're talking about? I presume? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've been working on this project. Uh, well, I've been in production with it since 2016. Right. And, uh, now I tell people when they ask that we're finishing the film, quote unquote, like we're in the mode now of finishing it. Okay. So. Uh, and and what, I mean, uh, how, how, what is it? Is it uh, archival footage and new interviews with people or, or what's the sort of approach you've taken with this? Yeah, all of the above. And, okay. uh, we have some film footage of him and uh, audio interviews with him. I mean, I have tons of archive material from, you know, different types and different eras, and, but uh, lots of original interviews too. Mm-hmm. We still have we still have more to do, but uh, anyway, we, yeah, we have a, like a ton of material. And what what is it about his life and and his story and his work that that made you want to undertake this this project? Well, the thing that hit me was how just utterly remarkable it, it is and, and unfathomable that, that it is. The guy did what he did. It's almost zero re- name recognition. I, and over the years, I, ch- I quiz people all the time. People who are music obsessives, I quiz them and say, have you heard of record producer Tom Wilson? And I get so many, I almost always get a blank stare. Right. And, I, and I'm like, well, you've heard of... Uh, the Velvet Underground, right? And you've heard of uh, <laughs> Simon and Garfunkel and Frank yeah. Zappa, and you've heard of uh, like a Rolling Stone yeah. and all that stuff like that. You know what I mean? This is like the most iconic rock music in the world. And the, and the truth is, like, not Dylan, he was already signed to his record deal when he and Will, Tom Wilson hooked up, but with Simon and Garfunkel and Frank Zappa and the Velvet Underground, I dare say that we would not know those names if it weren't for Tom Wilson, mm-hmm. you know, he was the gatekeeper. He was the one gatekeeper at, at the time, at that moment, who was going to let those people get out into the world. Right, right at that moment, nobody but him was going to do it, or would have done it. So, I mean, we have him to thank for at least that, but a lot more too. I mean, he just sort of, to me, he was a real sh- uh, uh, like a landscape altering figure. Mm-hmm. in popular music you look at the bullet points in his legacy and it's like a list of the 
main provocateurs in popular music <laughs> since World War II, uh, you know, like the Wands who really like, like the Velvets, for instance. And, but the, you know, like before all that, he uh, discovered Cecil Taylor and Sun Ra. Right. And those people may, those names might not be familiar to rock music fans so much, but their influence is part of the DNA of popular music, indispensable yeah. part of the. It's a pretty yeah. short line from Sun Ra to Zappa, really. I mean, you know. Yeah. You, well, I don't have to tell you, but yeah, the, I, you know, that's that was the other thing is when I looked at the list, I saw that there was a connectivity there. Mm -hmm. I, in my mind, there was, you know, and I, like and as the, fr the further I've gone into it, I see even more connectivity, you know. And, and interesting, I mean, he must have been one of the only African American producers at that time, sort of, who wasn't, you know, maybe consigned to doing rhythm and blues or soul or whatever, that he was, you know, working in this rock arena. Yeah, honestly, it was, it was less, to us now, it seems like, how, how could this black man have worked with all these white rock and roll groups and now we see see it that way but in his time you know there were black he was he was the only uh african-american staff producer at columbia records and the first one ever hmm. and there were a couple other producers that like you know there's a guy named henry glover mm -hmm. who uh and then uh clyde otis at mercury records quincy jones with leslie gore sure but Wilson, you know, like has this really solid legacy of working with acts that changed rock music. And uh, he really believed in it. There was there was a moment in time when he just completely believed in the hippie rock thing and, and how that was going to be like, you know, enlighten humanity. Like he really believed it for two minutes, you know. Mm -hmm. So do you have anyway, a black then there, back then there were other, you know, there in the recording studio world in New York in the early mid sixties, there were black studio musicians and black sure. arrangers and, and stuff, you know, but now we look at it and go, Oh, wow. How is that possible that black and white people work together on, mm -hmm. on this stuff? You know, it's, it just seems weird to us now. That's another thing well, we're yeah. looking at is why, why does it seem weird to us now when it mm -hmm. wasn't as weird then, you know? Yeah. But I mean, obviously the bands were integrated. I mean, even, you know, even miles had an integrated band at that point, but you know, again, as a producer, it seems he was sort of out there on his own, you know, a little more. Yeah. yeah. So I've heard the family is supposedly doing a, wanting to do a biopic about, about him. Is that yeah. any way, I mean, you're totally separate projects, obviously, but is, is that causing any sort of problem or communication or is it just they're doing your thing, you're doing, or they're doing their thing, you're doing your thing? It seems that way. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, that's how I think it is, and uh, that's how it is as far as I'm concerned. Right. And, do you, do you know, have I, a relief? I, rate? I, I, no, like I said, you know, uh, we're uh, we're finishing it now. Okay, because I know you need a deadline. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, this is different, though. You know, uh, this is like a whole other world that I'm sure. in now. It gets finished it's, when it gets finished, right? Yeah, but I believe that we can that we can finish it this year, and that it's the right time for us to do it. Great. Yeah. Uh, aside from that, uh, I mean, not like you've not like you're not doing anything. You've got these reissues coming out. You got a movie on the go. Is there anything else that you're that you're working on? No, it's the reissues and the film project. And uh, well, I'm playing shows too. Uh, are you? I am. Are you able to do that now? Where you are? Well, there were two in January that got moved to April, uh. and of course that put a, put a chill through me because. Of a repeat of 2020 is like mm -hmm. no 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 i can't no so uh i was sad when the two shows got rescheduled but um but anyway starting in june of last year i started i pl started playing real steady throughout the remainder of 2021 mm -hmm. and, uh, i have two shows of my own in february and they're they're still on the calendar Hmm. Is it just you and a guitar, or do you do you have a touring band? <laughs> no, I have I have like three, two, three, four different situations now. Oh, okay. And uh, I still do stuff with the 
the bottle rockets kind of broke up. We, you know, we talked right. about them a minute ago. They yeah. kind of broke up because the again. <laughs> well, the singer songwriter guitar player decided during lockdown that he liked staying at home and just wanted to do that for the rest of his life, I guess. And uh, Fair enough. so he retired from the road. But the three guys that uh, are left, they, they still play. And one of them actually joined Sun Volt as a guitar player. So I got to work around their schedule if I want to work with him. But, you know, I still do stuff with the with those three guys. I've got this thing I'm doing now, which is like an acoustic rock and roll trio where I play acoustic guitars. And then there's a fella named Manuel Quintana on uh he doesn't use like a drum set. It's like, it's this kind of percussion rig that he put together. And then uh, for the shows in February, the bass player is Tony Gagne, who's uh, pretty well known mm -hmm. and has been a friend of mine for eons and he's going to play stand up. So I hope, I love that little ensemble. And then the other thing I do, I don't know about this, if you, I don't know if you know about this or not, but I do this thing with where I am a guest vocalist with the smithereens. Oh, yes, yes. Are you familiar with them? Of course. I never know. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm an old guy. <laughs> OK, there you go. Uh, yeah, their lead singer uh, mm -hmm. passed away. Yeah. Uh, so now uh, they, you know, with their gigs, I, I'm the singer on their gigs most of the time. And then sometimes it's Robin Wilson from the Gin Blossoms. But uh, so that's a, that's another one of my. Hmm. One of my gigs, one of my side gigs, or one of my, I do it a lot. So I guess it's one of my main gigs. Yeah. Do you, do you like having all these different sort of, you know, pots on the stove or would you, would you prefer to, cause it seems like you've kind of always been that way to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. I so. do like it that way. It, 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 it does. It feels great. I, I like all the, all those different situations I just named. Hmm. Uh, Are you kind of a short attention span kind of guy? I think so. Yeah, I think that's. I feel like I have like the attention span of an eight-year-old still, but I don't know. All right. Well, listen. <laughs> I think I've taken up enough of your attention today, so uh, oh, I will, okay. I will, I will let you go. Well, thank you very much again for uh, checking in with me and plugging the new stuff and the old stuff and everything else and. Uh, it's good to see Iggy up there on the wall and David Bowie. Well, yeah, I mean, I was, I was going to say growing up in Michigan, I mean, you were you were what, like 15, 16 in the late 60s, right? So, yeah, I mean, that must have been Iggy and the Stooges. And uh, were you, you know, able to be a part of any of that, see any of that, uh, experience that? Yeah, I was too young for the Grandy Ball mm. at the center of the yeah, yeah. I think the thing you're talking about. I never made it to the to the Grandy, but I wound up seeing all those bands just because during the summer of uh, 1969, the scene really exploded to where it kind of spilled out into the suburbs, and I would see right. bands. It was like there were bands everywhere, and then I went to this thing one day at the State Fairgrounds where I did see the Stooges. I just mm. saw them once, but thank God that I did, and uh, I saw like every Grandy ballroom band. Right. on that one day you know so anyway well, yeah. yeah there you go I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with a bottle rocket story talking about them breaking up the the last time i saw the bottle rockets they played a set got off stage got into a fist fight <laughs> broke up <laughs> oh my god <laughs> well they've had a lot of personnel changes over the years so maybe maybe why <laughs> maybe they kicked maybe they, the two main guys kicked out everybody else and started over again but anyhow that's funny uh -huh. uh, you know thank god i never saw them getting a fist fight yeah, wow. well it was entertaining <laughs> all right sir well listen thanks for your time today and thanks for the music and uh we'll see you somewhere down the road hopefully all right be well man thank you you too bye, bye.